I think I'm going to ask uh, Charlie Meadows to open us in prayer, and then Paul Kelly, and uh, then we have some extemporaneous speeches to be given before we get into our meeting. So, um, Charlie? Father, we come before you today with thankfulness in our heart for your many blessings to us and the goodness that we are able to experience on a daily basis. Along with that, we also understand that we have many serious problems by created more than anything else by people who hate <coughs> you, who dishonor you, choose to walk after their own flesh, and choose to serve the person that comes to kill, steal, and destroy the enemy. Lord, this is a political organization, but we respect and honor you and your principles and your truths. And now we're coming up to a very important time, an election, where in our country you've given us ability for self-government. We need your wisdom. We need your help. And sifting through all the noise that's out there, making those decisions for people who would best honor you. None of us are perfect, Lord. But we, we need to choose the ones that will do the best job possible. So, Father, we ask your blessings on this time together, the food that we've eaten. Give us discernment. Help us to understand the issues before us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. <coughs> Paul Kelly, you want to leave the pledge? Pledge of the Colors. And salute. Pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of these United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. Uh, I've got a couple of quick announcements. First, I... Uh, you know, Charlie talked about the fact that we're a political organization, not a religious organization. However, however, there's not one person in this room who is not personally created by the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we all have a moral obligation to walk before Him. And our father, a few generations back, Adam, the day he was created, God looked him eyeball to eyeball and he said, in you I've placed my image. And your job is to replicate that be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and uh, express his glory as he ex exercises as God's vice region on the planet uh, to spread the glory of Christ throughout the earth. And that is your job. It's your only job. You will never have another job. It's your ordination before God. So while we're not a church or a religious organization, we are in a way because we've all been created by God. It's very clear in the word of God that he created us even in the womb, he was forming us. So we have moral responsibilities before him in everything we do, in our marriages, in our businesses, in our politics, everything we do, we do to his glory. So that is a critical point. And I have, uh, we'll get to this just in a moment, but Mike Biggs is here, Pastor Mike Biggs. I asked Mike, because today is uh, famous <clears throat> in America as, a, as Halloween, but uh, the significant event on this day was it. It is the day on October 31st that uh, that rascally Lutheran, Martin Luther, not Martin Luther King, Martin Luther. <laughs> and by the way, Martin Luther King's father was so enamored with Martin Luther, he, that's why he changed his name to Martin Luther King, and that's why Martin Luther King Jr. picked it, out of their respect for the real Martin Luther, who 501 years ago nailed the theses uh, to the, and he faced the uh, Catholic Church door. He did it not to start a, a public brouhaha. He wrote it in Latin, the language of the academics, but some other rascally guys thought, that's pretty good. We're going to translate it into German. So then the Reformation spread as Germans read it in their own language and realized that uh, they, uh, they needed to study the Word of God for themselves. I wanted, before we get started with Mike, and Mike's going to speak just for a few minutes on the Reformation and the impact that has had on Western civilization. Uh, but I wanted to, Will, Willard Lizzie is with us here today. He's unprepared, but Willard, 
Are you capable of speaking for less than 60 seconds? <laughs> no. <laughs> Good answer. Good answer. I'm going to give you 61 seconds if you want to say anything about your campaign. Willard is the uh, Republican uh, candidate for the Senate Office 48. 48, you're standing in. I'm standing in Senate District 48. So Willard is running to be the Republican. He is a Republican nominee. He's running for election. And uh, Willard, could you talk for 61 seconds? You know what? Give him 65, and I'll just give him five of my seconds. <laughs> yeah, because he's next after you. <laughs> I thank you, and so taking my time wisely, I am the uh, Senate, uh, I'm sorry, the Republican candidate. Uh, we have a very uh, interesting race. Uh, since I only have 60 seconds, I'll get right to the juggler. Uh, very unfunded campaign. It's very much so. I think that we are the voice that Senate District 48 voters and constituents need to hear from. Uh, we have the message. Uh, unfortunately, Republicans are writing checks for my Democrat opponent, and that has caused me great grief. So, if you live in Senate District 48, can just a show of hands up there anyone that lives in Senate District 48? Okay, seeing no hands, then I need, I guess, a holes all off barred or something like that. Uh, we need to speak to that. I spoke to the party, and the party got angry. And so, with that, uh, they withdrew support. But I'm not stopping the race. They start voting tomorrow. My 60 seconds are up. If you could be a help or an aid, this is a race that we need to look at. Thank you. Wow. That's impressive. I think it was Abraham Lincoln who said I could talk for an hour or two unprepared, but if you want something in like six minutes, I'm going to have to work all week on that. So, a very nice job. We have also a surprise guest, Charles DeCoon. He's neither Republican or Democrat, but he's running as an independent for state treasurer. Turn the mic off for the independent. I get that. <laughs> Joseph, you might check the batteries. And I don't know if we got them out or not, but uh, all right. Yeah, it's amazing how they've cut the mic off for people they don't like. <laughs> I mean, if you're a Repu if you're not a Republican, <laughs> yeah, it is Halloween, so we are going to advocate for some Democrats today. So why not have a, an, an independent? Honestly, I think the camera's pointed up here. Joseph is no longer. You want to, uh, Rick, want to help on the camera? I can, yeah. It's good. It's good. It's good? good. All righty. Uh, all right, talk to us about your race. Charles Lacoon running for state treasurer as an independent. It's, it's kind of odd because Willard and I are in similar situations. I am running as an independent against a Republican. Uh, he's been there for six terms, and uh, it's time for a change. I, uh, uh, you know, I am a true financial responsible person, and uh, I think at the state treasury you need someone who knows finance and someone who knows how to turn the, uh, the economy around. And um, I would ask you to please don't go straight ticket. Uh, you know, look at all the races and vote for the best person. I'm definitely a fan of the Second Amendment, obviously. I'm, I, I am not carrying my gun today, but I do have my uh, concealed carry uh, <laughs> uh, license in, in, in my pocket. Uh, I would say extremely underfunded, just like just like yours, I think, and probably 12 to 1, so for every dollar I have, he has 12. Uh, I think it's grassroots and we can actually win this. Uh, it's, it's, I hate to say that, it's time for him to go, and, and someone with, a re with real financial experience to, uh, to come in and, and turn things around. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> I've never met Charles before, but as you're speaking, I think that this guy's German. So I went over and asked his friend Aya. He, she said, yeah, he's from Belgium. I'm from Belgium. Yeah. And you speak oh, French? Original man. I mean, I'm, I'm so proud to be an American. I, 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 I worked for 12 years to become a citizen. And, and um, yes. this is, when I landed in America, within a couple of days, when, when I landed in America, within a couple of days, I, I knew this is, this is home. Well, thank you, and we know you're man for the job because the farther away you're from, the smarter you are. <laughs> and you talk so smart. That, that accent really ups your IQ, at least 50 points. So before we get to Mike, one more. Uh, Aya Kelly, we uh, supported Aya in her senatorial race, and Aya's from Guthrie, I think, and she uh, impressed us quite a bit as uh, a vivacious, intelligent, uh, future leader, I think, in uh, helping to transform Oklahoma. 
politically and culturally in many ways. So uh, Anya was, has expressed her appreciation for what OPEC did, so we've invited her to come and just uh, talk to us for a few minutes about uh, what OPEC meant to race. Thanks so much for allowing me to come and speak to you guys just briefly today. I don't have time, obviously, to tell you about my campaign and how God led me through that, but I did want to come and thank you guys so much for supporting me. As a single entity, you guys um, donated the most financially to my campaign, and while that did help me financially, it really boosted me. It gave me the reassurance that I was in the right place at the right time. As a public and motivational speaker of many years, that did not prepare me for the forums and the debates and the interviews that I faced, but what did help prepare me for that was you guys. You guys um, come out and you vet us and you interview us and may I say interrogate us. And I studied very hard for um, when I sat before you guys as a panel. And I really appreciate that. I appreciate your um, seriousness um, and your attention to detail on that. Um, so I received an endorsement from you guys. I received an endorsement from uh, Representative Jason Murphy from Senator Tom Coburn. I also received five mailers from the Oklahoma Federation for Children, of which I was extremely grateful. And I was one of Charlie's picks. Thank you, Charlie. That uh, really helped me in my efforts as I, I did need the confidence. I, I faced a lot of backlash from the liberals and the Democrats and the left. I was honored to speak with, uh, at Trump's 100-day rally two years ago, um, almost. And I stated at that time that it was not the time to relax. Yes, we have someone who loved America. And yes, we have someone who talks about God at the beginning of his speeches, during his speeches, and at the end of his speeches. But I knew that the battle had just begun. And here we are at midterms. And we have fought, I think, a harder battle and had a harder struggle than we thought that we would. Once we get past these midterms, for which I'm extremely confident for, even though I lost by 13% to wind energy and $168,000 uh, opponent, I, we, I have faith in these midterms, but we have another two-year battle ahead of us to fight, fight for Vice President Trump, or President Trump and Vice President Pence, I certainly hope. But you guys have thought so futuristically in, in thinking ahead and, and vetting the candidates and knowing that who you were voting for. And you know, as I traveled across the district, people know about OPAC, and the liberals really know about OPAC. They grilled me about that. So. Um, I visited with uh, Vice President Pence a few days ago in Tulsa, and you know he gives you such the confidence. He's kind of the uh, the uh, yin yang, if I can use that term, to uh, President Trump. And I enjoyed speaking with him. What I want to just wrap up with is, is that each time he speaks, he quotes from Second Chronicles seven fourteen, where. God says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and you know, seek his face, that he's going to hear from heaven, he's going to forgive our sins, and he's going to heal our land. And that's exactly what our land needs. Oklahoma voted straight red. I thought coming into this as a conservative would be easy. But you know what? We're just, we're just a hair away from not being totally red here in the state of Oklahoma. We need a healing and we have a responsibility. I want to thank OPAC for towing the line and for standing in the gap. And thank you so much again for your support. Wow. I'd forgotten what a great speaker you are. We should have you every week <laughs> to come and uh, fire up the troops. So I appreciate that, and I appreciate what you're doing. Um, I wanted to uh, have Mike, Mike Biggs come up and talk a little bit, maybe 10 or so minutes, about... Um, what today means uh, in terms of Western civilization and world history. And I think because the left owns almost all the media, all entertainment, and all you know, the news, the entertainment, and, our, and most of all, our educational institutions, most of us have 12 to 16 years of government education. We're completely ignorant of what God is actually doing. And so I wanted somebody on this day, the day that Martin Luther put that one nail on that Catholic church, and he had no idea the explosion that was going to happen. And, and it sort of makes me think uh, it's the reverse of that little, little story that says, for the lack of the nail, the horse lost the shoe. For the lack of the horse, we lost the soldier. For the lack of the soldier, we lost a battle. And for the lack of the battle, we lost a war. But when <clears throat> Luther nailed, uh, put that nail on that Catholic church door, it was the reverse of that. An explosion took place. The Reformation swept swept Europe, 
Uh, the Puritans developed, they came to America, started 13 Christian colonies, and uh, we started the most, most powerful nation in the world and have sent more missionaries than any other nation in the history of the planet. Very significant. And so if we tend to think God is not still at work, just listen to someone like Aya and others. God is at work. So I wanted Mike to come and review that history with us. So Mike, if you would come. And uh, Mike, do you want me to put this in, uh, let me stick this in the, uh, I think you remember Mike. He's pastor of Christ the King Presbyterian, uh, a PCA denomination, one of the, the Dr. D. James Kennedy began. Did he die before you became a PCA guy or was he still alive? Still alive, yeah. My parents went on a cruise with him, so he means a lot to us. And Mike means a lot to me, and uh, so Mike, take it away. Uh, I, I'm just wondering uh, if Charles's accent adds a number of points to his IQ with my southern accent does to me. <laughs> I trust not too much. Um, uh, Bob asked me to speak about the impact of the Reformation and then he told you what that was, so I feel like uh, I want to say let's close in prayer. But, <laughs> but uh, I, I'm going to try and be brief. I, I do want to say one thing. Um, it was mentioned that um, Oak Pack's not a a religious organization and I think it's important that we understand what that means and what it doesn't mean because um, uh, to me what that means is that we don't our purpose OPEC's purpose is not to promote uh, a, a religion or a religious um, uh, institution but I think having said that, it's really important for us to, and, and as we think about the Reformation, to realize that we're all coming from someplace religious. We're all coming from religious uh, presuppositions. And that's no less true for our, our political uh, uh, deliberations and our political positions. It makes all the difference in the world whether we believe that a, uh, a, bait, that a, a fetus is a human life. That's a religious point of view. It makes all, all the difference in the world whether we believe that people ha should have private property or whether the government should own everything and distribute it uh, allegedly equally to everyone. That's a religious conviction. And uh, as we make laws, and I've made this point before, as we make laws, uh, we need to realize that uh, those laws and the rationale for them comes from a religious perspective that there is no such thing as religious neutrality. Everyone is coming from some religious point of view, and that religious point of view informs what they believe about what should be law. And that means that that informs their politics. And that's no less true for OPAC. And so <clears throat> it's important for us to, to uh, take a stand on what we believe is true philosophically slash religiously. The definition of religion, the most important definition of religion as I see it is uh, our set of presuppositions or our view of the world, our worldview. And um, uh, I advocate uh, that uh, Oak Back as, as others and, and our government, unashamedly I, I advocate that that, that uh, uh, position should be a Christian one. If God's law doesn't govern how we approach the making of laws, someone's perspective is going to govern that. Um, and if we don't want God's perspective to rule that, whose do we want to rule that? That's the question. And so as we come uh, to this, just really quickly, um, I've used half my time to make that point. Um, what was the Reformation about? I, I want to just say just a couple of things historically and then tie it together really quickly biblically why it's so important. Uh, Martin Luther got the ball rolling, and Martin Luther was the catalyst of the Reformation, uh, an, an essential catalyst. He's the one that, that, that uh, began to uh, put that burr uh, in, under the saddle and, and that pebble in the shoe of the religious institutions and, and stir the pot with the people, raising issues. Uh, but then there were others involved, and... Um, uh, John Calvin was absolutely 
uh, crucial. There's a book that I would commend to you called uh, Calvin in the Public Square that is a, a wonderful documentation of the influence of John Calvin not only on the Reformation and not only on Protestantism, but on Protestant countries and on what we've come to call the Protestant work ethic. And I would say that that Protestant work ethic, which was in, emphasized in, uh, in Calvin's teaching, uh, in what he did in the city of Geneva, uh, particularly politically, and, and then later through uh, what was, I believe, the first university ever, uh, the university that he founded in Geneva, as he taught leaders who went throughout Europe, he spread what was the basis for the Protestant work ethic. And what was that? It was uh, that to which uh, Bob alluded earlier, that um, the purpose of mankind was stated in when God created mankind, it was uh, to uh, be fruitful, uh, to multiply, fill the earth, and to subdue it, and to rule over all that God had created. We call this, uh, this has been known, become known as the cultural mandate. And it emphasizes that uh, God put man over the earth to, be, to bring something productive out of it. And Calvin, in commenting on this, and other reformers in commenting on this, Luther included, made the point that what this does to our work is give it a different, a different character. We think about our work in a different way because of that emphasis. In other words, the street sweeper can say that what I'm doing is just as important to God as what anyone else is doing, is what the king is doing, is what, as what in our day, as what uh, doctors and lawyers and others, because we're all doing it to bring God glory and we're all doing it unto God as part of work offered to Him. That teaching transformed the way the street sweeper approached what he's doing. Because he was taught that as I do that well, I'm glorifying God. And that's my purpose. In other words, our work, according to this teaching, is not simply to put food on the table or to survive. My work is an offering unto God and its purpose is primarily to bring Him glory. And you can look at the map historically. You can look at... at uh, what the result of, of this was historically as you divide the predominantly Roman Catholic, and I, I, I love Roman Catholics, I'm not trying to dis, dis Roman Catholics, but as you, as you divide the map according to those countries who were dominant uh, Roman Catholic countries and those countries who were dominant Protestant countries, which ones became more economically prosperous? You can see that when you compare Mexico to the United States and its development economically. That was largely, in yeah, South America, that was largely due to the difference between a Protestant theology of work and what had become the Roman Catholic theology of work. It had profound economic and political implications. And, and so I just want to close by making a point that I've made before, just really quickly, tracing something through the Scriptures. Uh, Psalm 2 is a passage that is frequently quoted in the, in, uh, the New Testament. And Psalm 2 um, is, uh, you might call it political, <laughs> very political, because it begins with uh, the rebellion of the kings of the earth and the rulers of this world taking their stand against the Lord and against His anointed one. And God's response to that, if you read Psalm 2, is uh, he, He's not worried about uh, whether their rebellion is going to be successful. <laughs> it says the Lord uh, in heaven laughs. He scoffs at them. And then He rebukes them, saying, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy hill. His answer is that He has enthroned His king, His anointed one, the one that later in the psalm He says, Today I have begotten you, you have become my son. He is, this is clearly a prophecy of Christ. And the New Testament develops the theology of Christ 
in terms of, in, in very many places, in terms of an exposition of Psalm 2. And <clears throat> Ephesians is one of those, is one of those main books uh, that, that uh, talks about this, uh, this very clearly. I just want to mention a couple of uh, verses. I want to read one passage and then refer to another. Uh, notice when, when Paul's preaching in Ephesians, and he, say, he, he begins to say, I'm, pr I'm praying for you. He says this, it's very interesting. I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation and the knowledge of Him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened. Well, enlightened to what? That you may know what is the hope to which He's called you, what are the riches of His glorious inheritance in the saints, in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of His power towards us who believe, according to the working of His great might, that He worked in Christ when He raised Him from the dead and seated Him at His right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. And He put all things under His feet. What does that sound like? Takes you back to Genesis 1. And gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. In other words, Jesus died, was resurrected, ascended to the throne, and seated and sat on the throne as our representative. And when he did that, he did that for us, and we did all of that with Him. And Paul confirms this in, in, uh, in Ephesians 2 when he says what God did after He says we were dead in transgressions and sins, and we were objects of wrath. He says, and God, but God, who is rich in mercy, raised us up with Christ, and then in, later he says, and seated us with Him in the heavenly realms. What's the point of that? It is that our ability to fulfill our original purpose stated in Genesis 1 is restored in Christ. And it has to do with uh, the rulers and the authorities. It has to do with the rebellion of civil government and rulers who embody the spirit of the age of the people. It has to do with their rebellion and reversing their rebellion. And so it, it, it's not exclusively political, but it involves politics. And I'll just close by, by pointing out to you, when we come to the book of Revelation, and if the, if the Bible had not said this, I would be afraid to say it. Okay? But if you look at Revelation 2 and Revelation 3, as Jesus is, right, is having John send letters, writing letters to the seven churches, in Ephesians 2, he addresses Thyatira, and he says to the one who overcomes, I will, I will make him ruler over the nations. I will give him the right to rule the nations. It, he's, he's quoting Psalm 2. And he says he will rule them with a rod of iron, just like Psalm 2 says. But he's talking to us. And then in chapter 3, it's even more pronounced when he says this, and this is, this is unbelievable if you think about it. He says, to the one who overcomes, this is to the church in Laodicea, to the one who overcomes, I will give the right to sit down with me on my throne, even as I overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. Now we have to hasten, hasten to add, that doesn't mean we're going to be God. And we'll never be God. There's always a creator-creature distinction. But what it's referring to is Jesus Christ as the God-man, as a man who has restored our right to rule over all that God has created. It is absolutely essential that we understand that. And the understanding of the implications of that transformed Europe. It produced the Protestant work ethic. I would say it's, it's, it is responsible for the unprecedented wealth that we in the Western world 
have enjoyed because of our application of that truth and its implications. The Reformation affected many things. Justification by faith alone, that's what we hear about, and that's absolutely essential. But there was much more to it, and there was much more of an effect that the Reformation had. And that began on this day in 1517 with the nailing of those 95 theses on the door of the Wittenberg Chapel. We are who we are largely in the Western world because of that event. So we need to thank God for it. Thanks for giving me this time. Uh, outstanding. I, I wanted Mike to say that, and I'd like to do that frequently at OPAC because there is no such thing as secular. No such thing. And I appreciate Mike saying that. The foundation of Western civilization was built on the idea that the church and the state both bow the knee to the Lord Jesus Christ, who isn't just a king, he is the king of all kings. And that gives all of us in this room the authority to do what we do politically, without any apology. So the rest of this time will be our Halloween time because it's Charlie Meadows, founder, president emeritus of Oak Pack. I can't even believe I'm about to say this, but he's going to endorse Two Democrats, not one, but two Democrats today. I don't know what happened to Charlie up in Canada and Alaska, but please don't ever take a trip there because something's gone wrong with this man. But Charlie, here, you take the rest of the meeting. I appreciate it. Thank you, Bob. Uh, I love that history, and I want to just share a few moments of history that's a little bit more modern than that, but I think you'll find that interesting. In 2006, I threw my hat in the ring for Congress. And 21 days later, I threw my hat back out of the ring. And that was for the benefit of Vote Pact. Found out that if I were to run for Congress and remain affiliated with Vote Pact, that uh, we would lose our tax exempt status. And not only do we, our, our membership dues, uh, the money we contribute, that's already after tax money, but then they would have taxed us at 35% on all the money we collected. And that was unacceptable. So that is the reason that I jumped out of that race. In that 21-day period of time, I went to the Bot Broadcasting Pastor Appreciation Luncheon. They have once a year. Met a fellow by the name of Paul Blair. I said, Paul, sure would like to meet with you here in the next few days. He said, sure. Gave me his, his phone number. Well, of course, once I threw my hat out of the ring, it wasn't necessary to meet with Paul, at least for my effort to run for Congress. Um... We have a good friend spoken here many times by the name of Bill Federer. And Bill is a nationally known author and speaker. He speaks about 400 times a year. That's a pretty good little trick. Yeah. Uh, but he, he does that quite well. Anyway, uh, Bill was coming to town, and I was trying to find locations for him to speak. So I called Paula. And I just met him that one time and said, Paul, you ever heard of Bill Federer? And he said, no. I said, well, have you ever heard of uh, David Barton? He said, sure. He says, I use a lot of Barton stuff in my articles that I publish in the paper. And I said, well, Bill and, and uh, uh, David Barton are probably two of the foremost Christian historians alive today. And he's going to be here, and he could be in your church if you'd like for him to be in your church. He said, let me check him out. So he went and checked him out on the, on the, on the you know, that electronic stuff, that technology <laughs> stuff. And uh, called me back and said, sure, love to have him on a Sunday night. And that Sunday night, Bill was in that pulpit, powerful speaker as he is, is what got Paul started on this on this road to political activism and culture war leadership that he's provided. Shortly after that, James Dunn was running for uh, state attorney general against a fellow by the name of uh, Drew Edmondson. And uh, uh, Moshe Tall uh, called me up and said, Charlie, I'm going to donate $5,000 to James. Well, we're having a fundraiser up in Guthrie at the, oh, that fancy place up there. I can't remember the name of it right now. And uh, he said, uh, it's $50 a head. You can invite as many people as you want, you know, up to, so we don't go over the 5000 So I got about 40 or 50 people to come to that. And uh, Bill Fetter was a keynote speaker. And Bill leaned on Paul Blair to go to D. James Kennedy's Reclaiming America for Christ conference in Florida that he had every year 
which was just about two weeks off. And Paul went. Paul came back. He called me up. We went out and had breakfast. He said, Charlie, it was fantastic. Why couldn't we do something like that here in Oklahoma? A reclaiming Oklahoma for Christ. And I said, we could, Paul. And so I gave him the names of a bunch of people. I didn't think OPAC could be a part of that because that was a 501c3. And we're a political organization. I didn't think we could mix those. But I gave him lots of information, people to talk to. And we were very supportive of that in the way that OPAC could be supportive of that. <clears throat> We ran that as um, Reclaiming Oklahoma for Christ about four or five years. Shortly after that happened, D. James Kenney passed away. And for about four or five years, no one came to the forefront to take the leadership reins of Reclaiming America for Christ. And finally, after four or five years of having Reclaiming Oklahoma for Christ, Paul called them up uh, in, in, uh, in Florida and said... Uh, if you're not going to use that name, could we use it? And they said, sure. And that's why Reclaiming America for Christ is headquartered uh, right here in Oklahoma now. So that's just a little history we'll, we'll catch up. Let's get to the business of this election coming up. I want to talk first about Kevin Stitt and Edmondson. I have debated Edmondson on Bach Broadcasting when Mr. Bach was the moderator of that debate. This man is evil. Yep. This man is evil. I cannot tell you how evil this man is. We were debating on an abortion issue. The last time the U.S. Supreme Court spoke to this issue, they left it up to the states to regulate abortion. We had a bill in the legislature to regulate abortion, or there was an attorney general opinion. I don't remember what it was now. But this man said, no, Roe v. Wade does not allow you to do that. Right after the U.S. Supreme Court had allowed uh, the states to do some reasonable regulation. This man, most of his ads are misleading and they're lies. They're part of the dialectic. I want to say something about Kevin Stitt. Um, after Dan Fisher lost, I certainly supported Kevin Stitt. And I want to tell you, he is an unknown. There will be things, I went to hear him the other night down in Moore, and this is the first time I've heard him speak extensively since we've got past the primary and into the general election. And there are some things that he will be good for Oklahoma on. There are some other things he's very naive on, and if he doesn't wake up, he'll be harmful to the state on them. But none of that compares to the evil and the liberalism of Drew Edmondson. These are all my opinions anyway. And so I cannot tell you, I, 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 know, I know Kevin Stitt did not fill out the survey for OK2A. And I'm very disappointed that he didn't. But that's not a reason to bolt and vote for Chris Powell. I know Chris, I know him well. I used to have him on my radio program. Chris is a very dedicated libertarian. And I just struggle with libertarianism an awful lot because of its lack of respect for God and God's Word and its principles. But I can tell you this. That would be horrible. This is a very close race. To make a choice to support him, Chris Powell, because you didn't like something about Stitt, would be a huge mistake to make. This is a very, very important race. And I want to tell you something else that's happened. It's been going on over the last three election cycles, and it really culminated this time. The teachers have been on the march to, gain, to regain control of the state legislature, and they have done it. Aya, yep. yes. what cost you the race was when you were on TV with Coburn. And they saw you there, and that caused those teachers to solidify against you at that point in time. And, and uh, you just never know how these things are. But I want to tell you something. The teachers are now in control of the legislature. If we give Drew Edmondson to them, they will be in total control of the state of Oklahoma. And it will probably take four to eight years of bad governance, destruction to our economy, 
the seeds of destruction to our economy were sown in this year's legislature. I don't mean it's destroyed, but the seeds of destruction to the economy were sown. Just to give you a good example. Gross production tax. Do you even know what that means? That means on every barrel of oil that comes out of the ground, or every MFC of, of uh, natural gas that comes out of the ground, before a company can, can even count one penny of expenses, they've got to pay a tax on that. And the oil and gas industry is a very capital-intensive business. And you pull money right out of their businesses. Do you know that most of the oil and gas companies in Oklahoma are not profitable? They have fancy buildings. They pay their employees really well. But Chesapeake Energy, which I just bought several shares, 500 shares of this morning, Chesapeake Energy is $9 billion in debt. And they were 20. And most all these companies are carrying heavy debt. If they're profitable, they ought to pay that debt off and they'd be out of debt. And what do we do? We up the we up the amount of money we're pulling right out of their pocket before they can count one penny of expense. And if Drew Edmondson's in there, he says, I'm pushing for 7% instead of 5. That is so destructive to this economy. But it's more than that. There are many things, whether it's, whether it's uh, tax on services or increased property tax, and that's something that's really bothering me about STIP. He wants to move to where education is funded more from property tax than it is right now. That would be a huge mistake. And hopefully that can be stopped. But anyway, so I just wanted to hit on that one. Let me go to the two Democrats that I'm recommending. And to no offense, sir, I want to say something about Randy McDaniel. Randy McDaniel has been the person in the state legislature over the last 12 years that has taken the bull by the horns on the seven retirement funds in the state of Oklahoma. When, when uh, Randy McDaniel first instituted his first um, piece of legislation uh, to start dealing with the, the terrible retirement funds, the teacher retirement fund was the second worst retirement fund in the United States of America at that time. It was only funded at about 34% of solvency. And he got one little law passed. It's a law I predict will be repealed. And that is you cannot give a cost of living raise to teachers without also having a way to pay for it. See, what was happening is they were giving them cost of living raises and it didn't matter how much money you put into it, they could drain it out the bottom faster than you could put it in. And when you plugged up the holes in the bottom and you stopped that, now that, that fund is about 72 to 75% solvent. It has improved dramatically without a tax increase. All the funds have improved dramatically. The one that is now actuarially sound is the Supreme Court Fund or the, uh, the fund for the, the uh, judges. And, and so anyway, um, I predict that if Edmondson is elected, we will see that provision removed and we will see huge cost of living increases that will not be physically, fiscally sound to do. Doesn't mean you can't give them at some point in time, but not until those funds are fully funded and actuarially sound. So, um, but I'm recommending we vote for all Republicans on statewide offices, but two. And those two are Labor Commissioner, where you have Leslie Osborne, another evil person, in my opinion. I don't use the word evil lightly. And the other one is um, Joy Hoffmeister. And you have to understand something. Folks, I moderated a debate between Joy Hoffmeister and Janet Barisi in, in uh, uh, Guthrie. And when I moderated that debate, people filled out cards to ask questions. I've been an education researcher for over 30 years. I had my own cards. Guess which questions got, got asked for sure before we had time for any questions. I can tell you 
I can tell you, I had problems with Joy. I mean, not Joy, but Janet Priest. I had my problems with her. But you have to understand what happened to her. When she started the first charter school, first two charter schools in, in Oklahoma City, she met enormous opposition, and she's a strong woman, and she ran over that opposition. Now she gets to become, now she gets to the place of being the state's superintendent of public instruction, and her style is to run over opposition, but the level of opposition is much greater there. And the teachers' unions rallied, and they badmouthed her. And they badmouthed her over all the testing and all this kind of stuff. And you, have you seen Joy Hoffmeyer's ad? Yes. We got rid of testing. Yes. You know what the testing was about? Accountability. Yeah. They got rid of that accountability. And the other thing that, that Janet Barisi was strongly in favor of was school choice. And I am too, if done properly. You've got to do it properly. Joy Hoffmeister is totally against it. Joy Hoffmeister was recruited by the Jinx and the Union School Districts and their unions up there and funded by, by them for the most part four years ago. <clears throat> and she's another one of those basically Democrat ideologues who has an R by their name and they so badmouth Janet Parisi that Joy was almost a walk-in and shoe-in. Here's the reason for the voting for the Democrat in both those races. In Oklahoma, it's very difficult to win today if you aren't registered as a Republican. The Stitt race could be an exception to that. It's very difficult today. It will be harder four years from now to defeat a liberal Republican than it would be to defeat a liberal Democrat. That's why I'm urging <coughs> a vote for John Cox and whoever the other person is running for Labor Commission. You have to understand the unions now control both of those offices. Those offices are totally controlled by the unions. Did you know that when Mark Costello was Labor Commissioner, he was able to get a resolution passed in a Republican state convention stating that if you are a Republican candidate and you take money from public employee unions, not private unions, public employee unions, you will not be eligible for funds from the Republican Party. Because what we saw is now that the Republicans were in control, these people were lobbying Republicans for what they wanted, but their ideology had not changed a bit. And so that was the purpose of that. Do you think the unions wanted Kathy Costello in there? No. Nope. Absolutely not. And the unions in Oklahoma all came together, led by the teachers' union. Yep. This is the most greedy, powerful, special interest group in the state of Oklahoma. And they came together and they defeated... Kathy Costello. And that's a tragic change. So I say on those two races, vote for the Democrats. Don't just leave it blank. Vote for the Democrats. Help put a Democrat in office and then maybe four years from, that, from now we can defeat them and put a good person in office. Otherwise, four years from now, you'll have those phony Democrats with an R by their name and you won't be able to defeat them. So that's a strategic vote. And you know, you not, generally don't share a strategy uh, publicly. I see the camera over there. But I don't care. I hope this one is, is uh, uh, shared strategically. Uh, so anyway, that's, that's the position there. Um, I, will, I have some of these. This is a very minuscule Charlie's Picks this year. I've got copies of them here if you want. Uh, I couldn't do state legislative races. I've been out of the country, uh, or out of the state, out of the country, and I just haven't had time to do the research. And I'm not just going to blank Republicans right down the road because many of these are Republicans now are really not. I'll give you a great example. Steve Vaughn, absolutely sorry Republican 
state representative from Ponca City. Eight years ago, he beats the incumbent Democrat. And then Steve gets in there and he's, he's, he's good for one year until he gets corrupted. And then for seven years, he's been as sorry as they are. That Democrat he beat, re-registered as a Republican, and came back and beat Steve in the primary this year. But that guy hadn't changed his stripes a bit. But he knew how to get in office. And, and, and I'm just telling you, the Republican Party has been infiltrated by many who, who came to realize a lot of this is organized by the, the teachers' unions, but they have they've realized that the way to take control is through the Republican Party because the Democrats are just too disaffected, particularly under all the years of Obama. So anyway, that's I just I just don't have the time to do the, the research. I will I have some of the justices here on the state Supreme Court justices. There are four of them on a retention ballot. Only one I'm recommending uh, approval is Patrick Wyrick. And Wyrick is a new appointee. I'm not pleased with him. I'm not at all. On most of the decisions that you would look at to determine whether they're good or not, he they were they occurred before he was on the court. <clears throat> but since he's been on the court, he actually wrote the majority opinion on one key vote, and I can't remember exactly what it was, but basically it was the determination of a bill passed in the legislature that was an increase in revenue. But was that increase a tax increase or a fee? And for those of you that know me, you know that that is, I believe, one of the most important things we do in the state of Oklahoma. We legally define that. That's never been legally defined. When we passed HB 1017, uh, and then, or excuse me, state question 640 years ago, we said you cannot pass a tax increase without a 75% supermajority or a vote of the people. But we left fees open for the people, I mean for the legislature to pass. But we never defined what that difference is. And Mr. Wiry wrote the majority opinion. And the very classic definition of what a fee is, he called a tax. And, and so I really wasn't, there's two decisions he's made that I think are really bad. A couple others are really good. So the jury's still out on him. And he's been appointed for a federal judgeship. That confirmation has not occurred yet. Um, he's young. He did work for Scott Pruitt. Uh, that may have had a lot to do with that appointment. I don't know. But uh, anyway, he's the only one there. And when it comes to the Criminal Court of Appeals, Scott Rowland is the only one and I, that I approve or suggest yes. It's no on the others. And when you get down to the Civil Court of Appeals, I don't know any of them. And I just didn't have the time to do the research. The state questions. Ron McQuirter, where are you, Ron? Over here. Okay, Ron has the Oklahoma Constitution <laughs> newspaper. I put it on the website last night. Okay, it's on the website. Um, my article in the Constitution this quarter, this uh, edition, I analyzed the five state questions. And I'm basically recommending yes on the first two and no on the final three. But if you want to know why, it's in that article. It's on their website. And Bob, will we put that on our website here also? Yes. Okay. So it can be on the OPAC website also. Put the, what are the numbers on the yeses? Okay. On the yeses, we have state questions 793 and 794. 793 is the eyeglass one. Right. And, and I, was, I, was, I thought that was a no-brainer until I really started researching it. And folks, there is some risk in that one. And I explained that in that. I still favor it in the name of competition and consumer choice. But I want to tell you something. Uh, what's probably going to happen is Walmart is going to contract with the optometrists that come into their, uh, into their stores not to do health screenings. Walmart is the biggest push for this bill. Yeah, they're the biggest push for it. And they'll contract for people, for these, op uh, these optometrists and opticians um, when you come in, see right now, there's an oversight board that 
that sets the standards. So all optometrists now, not only do they examine your eyes for corrective lens covering, but they also give you a complete health screening looking for glaucoma and other problems. Walmart will contract, I believe, with opticians not to do the health screening. Why would they do that? They can see twice as many patients in a day. And if you see twice as many in a day, you can reduce your prices. You see what I'm saying? And, and uh, I still believe in that choice if that's what you want. But you need to understand, particularly if you're older, you're not going to get as good a eye exam as you would by going to your doctor right now. They're going, to, they're going to take over all the insurance companies and Medicaid. I'd say no. Well, I'm, 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 and that's fine. And that's fine. But I'm, I'm a yes on it. And I'm fine with anybody that wants to disagree with me on there. You know, because uh, uh, I'm just saying. See, I, I believe in, and I can't remember the French words for this. <laughs> okay. But there's the, the terms, there's two different French words. One means buyer beware. The other means seller beware. I'm in favor of buyer beware over seller beware. And we've moved from that buyer beware to a position of seller beware on most things that day. That's why we have so many lawsuits on everything, you know. But the reality of it is, when you move from buyer beware to seller beware, then, you, then your whole population starts depending upon government to regulate everything for their safety and everything. And what you do, you make you make people um, uh, weak and dependent, mm -hmm. as opposed to realizing this whole world out here is tough, and I better I better learn what's good, and what's bad, what's truth, what's lie. I I need to learn and be able to discern those things to watch out for my well-being mm -hmm. versus trusting others. I, I had a chiropractor customer one time. And I asked him, I said, is there a regulatory board over chiropractors? chiropractors? He said, yeah. I said, do you have any charlatans in your practice, in your profession? He said, sure. I said, well, what's, well, why isn't the board taking care of the charlatans? You know, and it just, you know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not totally anti-regulatory. Don't misunderstand me. But what I want is people to, to, to uh, grasp godly wisdom and discernment and knowing what's good, bad, right, and wrong and making those decisions like that. Uh, I think I'm getting the call for shut up, Charlie, and sit down. That's enough. Do, do you mind if I uh, spend 40 uh, seconds to tell you a little bit more about the pensions? Yeah, the pensions. Yeah, so okay. very quickly, there were a lot of reforms made mm -hmm. between late 80s and 2006. Randy came in in 2007. Randy came in in 2007. The reforms that have really benefited uh, the coffers uh, were made between the late 80s and 2006. Uh, and frankly, that plus a crazy bull market have really, really helped uh, the coffers. Um, I know that's what he's running on. That's why when people mention that, I, I correct him. Those reforms were pre-2007 reforms. Also, he did make a reform. There's a report made by the government, by, by the that he does not want you to know about, but since he made a, a major reform in 2014, after that, 2016 and 2017, the turnover costs of the state were $136 million and then $127 million the following year. That is a report done by the capital. So I wouldn't call that conservatism. If you are costing more to our taxpayers in, and, and reduce state benefits at the same time, that is not conservatism. So. If, if he's told you personally that he was the one who did those reforms, you might want to ask him about it. Those reforms were done between late 80s and early 2000s. 2000, yeah. Wayne Pettigrew was kind of the expert on that before uh, Randy came into office. Uh, but I know the legislation that Randy authored and passed, and I know what actually made the difference. And while I would agree with you, we're in a wonderful bull market right now. Uh, in 2008, for the next few years, we were also in a really bad bear market uh, for a while, too, that took a real hit. And uh, so, uh, but certainly investments. Yeah, but, but those are the reforms. The, 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 yeah. the, the post-2008, those reforms done in 2006 and before are the ones that helped after 2008 yeah. bull market. And, and investments are a very major part of the solvency and the strength 
of these retirement funds. And uh, so uh, that's a, an important aspect for a state treasurer uh, is to be able to invest uh, the money for the citizens of the state of Oklahoma in such a way, and, and your, your treasurer's not the sole person that does that. You have a board that uh, over, oversees a lot of those retirement funds and they make uh, recommendations and, and things like that on those investments. But uh, we want sound and solid investments, not high risk uh, things. And, and uh, so anyway, uh, and Ken Miller has been for the last uh, eight years, Ken is an economist. Um, and of course he served for several years in the, uh, uh, in the legislature too. But anyway, if you want one of these Charlie's picks, come up afterwards and they'll be on the table. Nice job, Charlie. Yay! And then when Charles comes up, I realize, wow, uh, the German accent does add about 50 points to your IQ. <laughs> I, I'm just amazed. Uh, by the way, um, let me pick up my weapon. Uh, yeah, if, if you're not a member, uh, <laughs> uh, that, that makes it shoot faster, more accurately and harder. Yeah, right over here, Susan Goodman has uh, your form, it's $50, and if you're not a member, uh, it's uh, you can take a bullet or, or just uh, Susan. And, uh, I was, uh, yes, you and I have not talked about this, but elections Tuesday and raising money for this election cycle is over. And so now what we're collecting is for the election cycle two years from now. I haven't talked to you about this, but we used to what we do after November 1st, which is tomorrow, maybe you can make it October 31st. For anyone joining that page your membership dues for the next year. But that's that's how you want to do it. I, I want your money now and then again in January. <laughs> That's why the better president I was. Uh, good. We, we could maybe knock the dues down uh, to a quarter. Yeah, you negotiate with Susan. Whatever she tells you, it's going to be, it's going to be fine. Yeah, that is an executive decision that we haven't discussed. So. Um, um, We'll have to take that up. I wanted to tell you all that uh, on the judges, there's only one judge I know that may or may not be on your ballot, but if uh, Judge Bill Graves is on your ballot, uh, the finest judge uh, that the uh, state of Oklahoma has ever known, a Christian, patriot, conservative, and uh, he's probably on some of your ballots, a district judge, and he will be speaking here in about a month when Dr. Andrew Sandlin comes to talk to us about secular conservatism. And that's what uh, we addressed today, and I, I appreciate Pastor Mike Biggs talking about the biblical, godly foundations of all that we do, including and especially our politics, because Jesus is king of all kings. And so thank you, Mike, for laying that foundation. Well done. And um, so we'll hear more about that here next month. Bobby Cleveland is coming next week to talk about the, um, uh, to whatever extent he can, uh, the role that was played by Republican leadership, and I can't remember that guy's name, I think he's an ex-Marine, actually. Uh, former. Cat, Hassett, former Marine. Kennedy. Former Kennedy. Uh, yeah. Kennedy. Uh, to unseat incumbent conservatives, and we lost a number of very, very good men uh, through that effort, and then, then, of course, through the uh, public unions. So, Bobby Cleveland will be here next week to address that topic and you'll want to be here. Membership guides uh, negotiate terms with Susan. And uh, then we had these left over. We did a tape for the Bot Radio Pastors Lunch. And over here, these are just state questions. I think they're probably very close or identical to Charlie's. <clears throat> and then we have um, also a uh, OPEC promotional piece that we did for the Pastors Lunch. If you want any promotional pieces, uh, to give up to all of your friends and the politically like-minded folks to recruit them to come here uh, to OPAC. We do need to recruit membership. So, uh, any other last-minute announcements? Uh, ah, yeah. So, Charlie mentioned David Barton, and he's going to be here Monday night speaking. 
Yeah, uh, Charlie mentioned David Barton, and he will be here Monday night speaking in Edmond, so um, it would be a great opportunity for you guys to hear a great historian. Where are you? One of the hotels. <laughs> if you go to eventbrite.com and search for David Barton, you'll find it there. That's what I was going to say. Okay. okay. About um, the movie that just came out, uh, I think it's two weeks ago from last weekend, called uh, Gosnell, yes. a oh, true yes. serial killer yes. in America. Gosnell, the trial. My, my two oldest boys did a photography on that movie, really? and I got to see it with my oldest son uh, this last week. Uh, and it was filmed been, here in Oklahoma. It's yeah. filmed in Gosnell. Yes, it was. Yep. Yes, it was. Uh, you can see it. Yeah. It's, I've That's, seen it twice. Cool. I highly recommend it. Okay, yes. 700 theaters. I think Susan's sister, did she do the casting for that? Uh, no. Not Gus, no. No, no, not that. She's, she hasn't done that for a number of years. Okay. All right. So if you want to be in a movie, uh, there's no need to meet your sister then no. anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So so none of us are going to get picked today because she was, okay. That's right. Any other announcements? Uh, I forgot to bring the flyer. There's going to be a conference a week from Saturday. I think it's the 11th of November. It's in uh Really in Arlington, they say Dallas, but it's in Arlington. It's around the, around the airport there. And it's put on by a group called the Abbeville Institute. And they're back east, and it's on nullification and modern-day secession. Dan Fisher's going to be one of the speakers. And they have several other real good speakers. But again, I forgot to bring that flyer. So if you look up Abbeville Institute online, it'll, it'll, and you can see it's going to be real good for Dan. Uh, <laughs> A B B E Y, I think, but I'm not sure. If I'm writing it down, I could spell it right. I'm talking about Abbeville Institute. Uh, but Dan Fisher is going to be a speaker, so I'm sure it's. I, I can email. I email it to a bunch of people. I can email if anybody wants it. They give me the email address. I'll send it to them. Boy, it just likes to embarrass people. Could you spell that for me, please? Yeah. <laughs> it's not here. It's not here. Okay. Abbeville. All right. You can look that up. Dan Fisher. No more announcements. Could I uh, ask Mike, Pastor Mike Biggs, could you uh, close us in prayer today? How many prayers do you have? can you give a day? And I don't know how much it's contracted. Depends on whether you want them in Latin or not. Okay. English would be fine. Maybe your southern accent. Father, we have talked about many important things today, and we've talked about issues. We've talked about uh, the commitments of different candidates. We've talked about um, the uh, deception that is that is uh, common in our uh, political process today, and the need for active discernment. Um, and so, Father, we pray that uh, that you would work in uh, the populace of our country to cause them. To uh, not to settle for complacent ignorance when it comes to involvement in the political process. Uh, thanks so much. Thank you so much for the for the uh, the advice and the and, and the, um, uh, the information today, making clear how uh, how we need to be involved and our stance needs to promote a people who know what they believe and know why they stand for what they do and are involved and know what's going on. Perhaps at no time have we needed this more. And so, Father, we pray that, um, that what we see in people becoming more involved or at least more exercised about their political opinions would be a hopeful sign that uh, more people will become engaged and knowledgeable and as that occurs, Father, we pray that you would bless uh, institutions and organizations like OPAC. Bless the efforts of uh, people here to inform people with the truth, to get that truth out. Give, uh, give our organization wisdom in doing that, that we might know how more effectively to do it. And, and to the degree that that promotes your truth, we pray that you would give us success. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Okay. Our October 31st special through Thanksgiving and Christmas for the rest of the year, $15. That gets you a member up until January 1st. Is that work, Charlie?
fifteen dollars into the year. I might join in. She's <laughs> the only problem is, is I, we've kind of always done that, and some people that have just paid recently may be under the impression that they have, are covered for next year, so we may want to start that. Next yeah, year. I'm already confused, but uh, you talk to Susan, <laughs> and uh, if there are any problems, I'll take care of them. Right <laughs> Thank you. See you next week for Bobby Cleveland.